Well, um, now our coming up here, Ulrike Kretzel. Ulrike Kretzel, she is really Indonesian because she comes, I think you come from Zweck, don't you? So she is Austrian and she is living in Australia. She comes from the University of Wollongong in Australia and you see uh, it's really great having a keynote speaker coming from Australia here to Salzburg. Um, so really looking forward for, to your presentation. Most of you, at least my students, you will know her for sure, because for sure you will have read one, two, three, five, ten, fifteen papers of her. So she is, she's a really designated, she's a really very, very known um, researcher in the field of tourism, and I'm really happy that we have such an excellent okay. No, I, I prefer this. So, um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, of course, a uh, real pleasure to be able to come back to Austria and uh, uh, share some of my ideas with you. Um, I thought about showing you a picture of Wollongong Beach and then I thought, oh, that would be too mean. Uh, so the university is just five minutes from the beach. Um, but it's starting to uh, get cold in Australia. It's, uh, it's autumn and um, so I guess uh, you have a very beautiful environment here too. Um, Christian and Roman asked me to talk about uh, tourism research and uh, I really think this is important for you even if you do not want to be a professor and honestly I never wanted to be a professor. I don't know how it happened. Um, but you will be in the industry, you might be doing research in the industry or you will be a consumer of research. Uh, you might commission research to people like Roman and Christian and you need to be able to say, look, I want you to look into this. Uh, you need to be able to read reports, so I think this is really important to th think about from your perspective. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is really how the world around us is changing and uh, that, that means that research also needs to change and that education needs to change because the kinds of things that you will have to do um, when you graduate and when you get a job um, are quite different from uh, um, some of the things that um, I had to engage with. So let's have a look at some of the changes that are going on. So of course we have new technologies, um, but in conjunction with that, we also have um, new mobilities. I mean, look at me. I um, am originally from Austria, have been educated in the US, and now live in Australia. Um, I'm one of these uh, George Clooney's from Up in the Air, if you know the movie. Um, I have a, a million mile uh, frequent flyer card there in my purse somewhere. Um, but also mobility of information, mobility of um, um, ideas, and mobility of products, of things, of travelers. It's not um, easier to go to places than it used to be. And that also changes our social worlds, um, the way we interact. Um, so if you think about it, we have a change in structures, industry structures, social structures. We have a change in behaviors, consumer behaviors, uh, social behaviors, um, organizational behaviors, yeah. and also perceptions. A lot of the new technology uh, is actually um, changing even our brains. So there's some really interesting research now available that shows that uh, um, using your iPhone all the time actually does change something in the way you think. So, what does that also mean uh, for tourism? So here's a traditional view of tourist behavior and uh, if you look at this, there's of course um, the traditional pre-travel phase um, and then the travel where we have a physical movement through space and time. So that's really the central uh, point of tourism. And then we have a post-travel phase. So 
kind of remembering your experience. It used to be inviting people over to look at your slideshow. Um, and it has always been a very social activity. Now, some people travel on their own, but uh, uh, still interact with people while they travel. And it is uh, very much a hedonic um, type of behavior. Although, I mean, some of us travel for business, but uh, um, still, uh, there's always some, some uh, aspect of entertainment and fun related to it. So, if you look at the traditional phases here, we have the dreaming, planning, booking, anticipating phase. And then, um, during the travel, we've always had some sort of documenting phase. So, people used to keep travel journals, um, they took pictures, um, they uh, uh, maybe collected um, tickets or postcards when they were traveling. And then we had the debriefing, sharing, reconstructing the experience phase. So what is changing now? You see here, uh, I'm trying to show here that across all phases here, um, the process has become a lot more hedonic, a lot more social. And those actions and uh, um, kind of uh, um, uh, activities really in relation to uh, dreaming, planning, booking, anticipating, uh, debriefing, reconstructing the experience and documenting now are totally messed up. They can happen at any time. Uh, so you don't have the traditional, I'm going to the travel agency, I'm booking my uh, flight. Um, you might actually just go to the airport, uh, see what's available. You might travel to a destination and book your hotel there with your mobile phone. So we see a shift here happening. And actually, I have to admit I stole this from uh, Google. Um, they are now also talking about a, a shift in, in the way we do business. And um, if you think about it, uh, we had a very much uh, focus on products. Uh, before, and uh, it was all about transactions. Then we moved more to uh, consumer, consumer experience, consumer journeys, um, experience value, um, and now it's more about the predictive year. And I'm not sure if you can see this. This is a baby uh, looking at a, a mobile phone. Um, so it is about consumer intent, trying to anticipate uh, what people would like to do, what they're thinking about. So um, what is also changing is that consumer is now a lot more connected uh, than he or she used to be. And uh, so the decisions that you make as a consumer are not uh, so much individual decisions anymore. Uh, very likely you get advice. As we have I uh, just heard in the presentation uh, by Professor Fink uh, from other people. And uh, those other people um, might be completely out of, outside of your normal social world. So they might be um, other travelers who post reviews. Um, but what is really, I think, um, most important for us to think about in the research context is um, this notion of, of all of this being more and more supported by technology. And uh, so we now have digital traces uh, that are uh, being produced in a number of ways. So we have human-computer interaction, so you uh, interacting with the website. Human-human um, through a computer, um, you posting on Facebook a uh, question about where should I stay in Salzburg, what should I do while I'm here. And um, human organization, uh, where increasingly you book everything uh, through a technology interface. But then we also have computer computer. Now devices are now talking to each other. Your mobile phone um, has apps. Um, your uh, data is being transferred. And then we increasingly also have things talking to computers and through computers talking to other things. Uh, so you might have a sensor um, in your clothing, for example. Um, so there's a wearable computing, um, now that is a, a big uh, trend. 
So I don't know if you've heard about the Internet of Things, but that's definitely something that uh, we will have to um, look out for. So I think tourism especially has to think about these things because tourism is big data. And if you think about it, um, there's uh, really a multiple um, arena of data sources here in, uh, in tourism. So we have, we have a very complex industry. So there is a lot of uh, industry-related data. We have complex products. We have a lot of descriptions. If you think about a destination and what it takes to really describe Salzburg as a product, um, we have government data. A lot of uh, tourism-related data is collected and distributed by governments. And increasingly, that information is available online. And then we also have the consumer data. So people are posting their pictures. They are posting questions. They are interacting with each other. They are giving feedback to companies. Um, and a lot of what they do because of the mobile phones or GPS in the cameras is now also geocoded. So what we uh, really have to think about is this geospatial tourism web. And um, the social tourism web where all these interactions are happening. And also the visual uh, tourism web where a lot of that information is really picture or video based. And I think for research you will uh, see in a minute that has some important implications. Uh, and Pinterest, by the way, is growing like crazy in the US. I'm not sure um, how popular it is in Europe, but uh, um, it's definitely um, growing. So, um, what does it mean? Now, for some of you, um, uh, you might think, oh, it's great because it's easy data. I don't have to stand out there, interview people for hours and hours. I can just go online and uh, have all the data there that I need. Um, well, that's true. There's an endless pool of widely available data. Um, and the focus is shifting more in that space from collecting data to really trying uh, to extract data from multiple sources and to manipulate it, uh, to process it, so that it is uh, possible to analyze. Um, a shift that I see very much towards secondary data analysis. So uh, you have existing data sets uh, that you take, but uh, really there's some issues that you have to think about this because you don't know how this data was collected. Um, you uh, don't have that kind of insight into the data source that you would have if you were uh, collecting primary data. Um, and there's also an increasing need for metadata, data of data because of that. Um, so we need to understand the different data sources and that needs to be transferable uh, so that you know what you're actually looking at. So, um, that data, though, um, is very dispersed, and if you're a tourism researcher, one of the problems is it's sometimes not easy to figure out what is actually tourism-related and what is not tourism-related in uh, that context. Um, tourism data is very contextualized, very local. Um, it's uh, very international. It's global. We have tourists posting reviews, for example, on TripAdvisor, and TripAdvisor sometimes just uses Google Translation to uh, have you, like, let you translate some of the reviews. Well, but you're losing that cultural context in which that review was written. Uh, we have done some research on blogging, for example, comparing Korean bloggers and, and uh, American bloggers. And very different uh, cultural uh, conventions in terms of how you blog, what you blog about, who you blog to. Um, Tourism is actually, I think, a very interesting space because we talk about liminality and, and thresholds and, and people do crazy things when they travel. Um, uh, we uh, have people go to uh, um, different places because it is out of their uh, usual environment. And their behavior can be quite irrational. So now as researchers, we're trying to make sense out of 
uh, this data when actually, um, really, maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, I also think that uh, um, in this whole big data conversation, some of the theory and the need for theory is being lost. Um, so I think it's very important for us to understand uh, how that data came about and what it means looking at some uh, uh, theories. So if you think about a traditional Marxist view of the web, uh, there's a technological base that uh, uh, determines the structure. Um, so we have to understand the technology and how the interaction was uh, structured um, by a system in order to understand the data that came out of that interaction. So it's not pure human uh, unmediated data. Um, I think it's also important to understand that uh, um, this really is a collective um, uh, phenomenon and, and you, uh, you have to increasingly look at social theories to understand collective behaviors. So it's no longer just individual behaviors. Uh, it would be, uh, I think, a, a problem to specifically look at just one uh, interaction here. You have to understand it within uh, the global um, phenomenon. So I think um, we need theory to make sense of these electronic traces, but that theory has to come from multiple places. Uh, we now have to think about systems. We have to, for example, think about gravity. Uh, we have to think about uh, um, crowds, uh, biological systems, ecosystems, to understand uh, some of the behaviors that we see in the data. So one of the things that people are looking at is web science, for example, understanding the web itself. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, really uh, interesting research being done on um, understanding the structure of the web and uh, um, with a very interdisciplinary um, approach to looking at big data. We need more of a relational perspective. So if you think about traditional research, um, we are thinking about one human being and their attributes. And you've probably learned in your basic statistics course uh, that uh, um, you know, all the methodologies that we have assume independent observations. Uh, and you cannot use um, multiple regression analysis if your observation is not independent. Well, a lot of the observations that we are finding now are not independent. So we really need new methodologies to deal with uh, that kind of data. We have interactions, we have influence, we have um, really relationships that we're looking at, not just attributes of people. We, I think, need to better understand structures and networks and network uh, analysis, graph theory, uh, can really help us understand uh, what is going on. So there's more and more research related to um, looking at the structure of networks, the structure of relationships, uh, structural properties and how they evolve. And um, so for example, uh, people are even trying uh, to map the tourism industry as it is um, represented online. We also need better ways of really extracting um, data and uh, maybe automating some of the analysis of the process and uh, then using that to even predict uh, tourism. So I think predictive modeling is something that really is becoming more and more important. So uh, what do I think we need uh, for our basic research methods uh, courses? I think we really have to be anti-disciplinary, and I stole that from MIT, um, because that's uh, um, how they approach problems. So MIT says, we are tackling problems that do not reside within a, a specific discipline. Uh, we want to really understand problems outside of disciplines, and we come into the problem uh, without the disciplinary focus. Uh, mixed methods, so I'm not sure uh, if you would identify yourself as a qualitative or quantitative researcher, uh, but I think uh, 
we really need to um, um, be flexible also in some of the approaches that we apply. Um, we really need to have a better understanding of extracting data and storing data. Um, so the, the future researcher is definitely a data scientist. All uh, those uh, feedback data uh, uh, experience descriptions is textual data. And right now we don't have good means of analyzing text. We're very good at analyzing numbers, um, but uh, text, especially Chinese, uh, text uh, we're still struggling with. So uh, that will be one of the challenges. Um, multimedia uh, data analysis, so audio, video, um, visualization and mapping, um, how do you actually um, transfer that data? But then also, if you're a qualitative researcher, how do you uh, do ethnography um, in a, this kind of global, big data, online environment? Network analysis, I already mentioned, and then I think there's more and more uh, trend towards simulations and complex modeling. So, um, and we don't teach enough of that. All right, uh, implications also for reporting. Uh, we need to think about how we present our results. Um, I think it's not enough anymore to just have a table. We have all these means out there to really visualize, to map, uh, to animate our results. We need to uh, take advantage of that. And uh, we also need to think about how we evaluate research uh, that comes out of this big data. Uh, because we don't know um, really who produced the data very often, who owns the data. There's a lot of ethical issues related to privacy. Um, I think consumers are also are getting more uh, worried about um, providing data. So maybe now we have this data influx, but in the future consumers might charge uh, for the information they are providing online. And uh, we need to think about credibility, validity, reliability, all those basic concepts that we uh, rely on in research, um, they're challenged by this online big data kind of research. Causality. Um, now we, we might see uh, causal relationships, but uh, um, they might be spurious. Uh, so we have to really think about what causes what. And uh, we really need to have a better um, ability of extracting context from the data so that we can better understand it. All right, to conclude, what do I think the tourism researcher of the future should look like? Now, I uh, put up here a, a photo of a crazy scientist uh, with a lot of uh, um, big data behind this person. Um, I really think that the tourism research of the future, and that's you, uh, needs a very diverse tool set and um, needs to uh, really understand um, what they're doing in terms of sampling, uh, coding, uh, justification of uh, what that data is, where it's coming from, uh, but also very um, theoretical things. And I think there's also a lot of room from a very critical perspective um, because we should not just take that big data, process it, and that's it. So those were just uh, a couple of my thoughts. I uh, am looking forward to questions now, but then also I'm sticking around for the day, so please come and talk. Thank for this really terrific and inspiring presentation about yeah, new frontiers in terms of research. Are there any questions from the audience? Well, you really made this very interesting point about this big data, and we had a meeting actually with Hannes Werbel and a few other tourism directors last week in Vienna, and this big data, yeah, data available on the web from the traces of the customers is really the, the key issue at the moment for many tourist boards. And you made this point that you said that maybe in the future the customers won't get paid in order to provide the data. This is actually turning the entire 
this is rolls around because at the moment very often the customer should pay if they access certain services on the web and maybe in the future uh, actually they get paid when they log on to HRS to booking.com because basically with the data that they provide, these organizations can make business. Um, yeah, I think it, it really challenges our perception of what, uh, um, um, what the role of the consumer is. And uh, I think companies right now really um, are misusing and abusing some of that information. Consumers don't really like that and because we have all these opportunities to make um, um, you know, that available um, to other um, consumers to, to have activism, to share our opinions. I think if there's a company that really um, takes that information and sells it, uh, that comes out fairly quickly. Um, and I think there's also the consumer is becoming more educated um, and unfortunately there's also a lot of uh, bad people out there um, stealing identities and our identities is more and more based on um, everything digital. So if you lose your mobile phone, just think about all the information that you have stored in it and uh, how much of your entity, identity you are actually uh, really losing if that happens. And uh, I think there will be services uh, that help consumers manage their identity, their, their personal information. And uh, it will be more of a, I think we already see it a little bit where we have you know, eBay auctions where the consumer says, well, uh, what can you give me? Here's what I, you know, what I want. So it's going to be more of that going back and forth in terms of um, exchanges, so not the company-dominated transaction. Yeah, thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Uh, that's one. Roman, yes, yes, it's one question. Mm -hmm. well, you know that I'm currently working on stuff on crowdsourcing and open innovation and cooperation. Do you see in the future that we will integrate the customer way in our research directly? That we open up our research so that we can integrate the consumer? Yeah, I, uh, I think um, actually some of the qualitative researchers are very much exploring uh, that. So the, the notion of um, you know, the subject in an experiment that is being exploited for the benefit of research, I, I think that's uh, um, very much going away. So uh, participatory research um, is, is definitely something that people are looking at. Um, and I think also a lot of people really, the culture now is that it's a contribution culture. And a lot of people would like um, to contribute to research. And uh, if you look at Google Health, for example, um, that's really what that all is about. So people are uploading their entire health histories for the benefit of research. Um, and uh, it's enormous data that is, is basically uh, consumer driven. So I think, yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe for those who have not well, yet written the master and bachelor thesis, you think about different approaches, not only expert interviews and the typical questionnaires that you send around, but using maybe here also, uh, yeah, this new type of data sources, uh, or as Roman said, uh, crowdsourcing, open innovation, big issues at the moment in research, really, really in interesting and very, um, yeah, reliable data sometimes as well, if you know how to interpret it and also if you know how to analyze it and then use it. Okay, thank you very much again, uh, Ulrike, for your presentation. Uh, yeah, give a please a warm hand again. Thank you very much. <laughs>